Hi, I'm John Loretz from International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War. Robert E. Fry is an Emmy Award-winning producer and director of news and documentaries. His most recent film, In Search of Resolution, is the third in a series on the continuing challenge of dealing with nuclear weapons. It was preceded by In My Lifetime in 2013 and The Nuclear Requiem in 2016. Earlier in his career, Bob produced broadcasts at ABC News, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, and public television in the United States. He was executive producer of ABC World News Tonight with Peter Jennings, executive producer of Good Morning America, and the creator of World News This Morning. He founded his own independent production company in 1988. I first met Bob at a screening of In My Lifetime and was glad that he reached out to me to do this interview about the new film. Uh, and the interview will be posted on the, the IPPNW Peace and Health blog. Bob, it's good to see you again. John, a pleasure and glad to hear your voice as well as to see you. <laughs> right, well, uh, thanks, for, thanks for reaching out to me and uh, let's talk about your film for a while. Uh, this is your third film about the dangers posed by nuclear weapons. What compelled you to take up this issue more than a decade ago and what keeps you at it? Well, I think what keeps me at it is the story isn't over and continues and is much more complex in many ways today, in part because of the war in Ukraine, as you know full well, um, January of 2022, the five original nuclear weapon states announced they will not fight a nuclear war, either be between themselves or whatever other combinations you want to think of. But as we know also is six weeks later, Mr. Putin decided to invade Ukraine. That's brought this subject to the fore again, I think. It's a challenge, I think, for all of us to understand that the weapons themselves, and certainly in your work over the years, you know full well the dangers that they create. And also, the, and since we're now talking about it in, in terms of everything that's going on, your work with uh, the IP, P and W, I didn't get that right, did I? You did. Good. Um, I think that it's important what your mission is and how you develop these ideas to try and change the dynamic of nuclear weapons, both in terms of their use and also in terms of the attitudes of people around the world. And those that are involved in organizations such as yours obviously are at the forefront of creating an environment where at least people are aware of it. One of my chores, I think, over the last 10, 12 years has been just to have these films out there to make people aware of not only the dangers, but the underlying dynamics of the nine nuclear weapon states, as well as what's with all of the other uh, states in the, in the world. Um, as you mentioned just before we started this conversation, the TPNW obviously is a new start, if you will, not the treaty, but a new start in looking at ways to resolve the ongoing challenges. Mm -hmm. And although it's only been now two, three years, I think it's made progress in terms of the number number of states that have joined the TPNW. Mm -hmm. At least it creates... Not, not, not to interrupt you, but I want to come back to that. I, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about that. Okay. Uh, um, as, as you pointed out, uh, the first part of the film focuses on the Ukraine war uh, and the frightening implications of that conflict for, for, nuclear, for nu a nuclear armed world. Um, the nuclear threats that have come out of Putin's government are obviously alarming. But some of the most disturbing voices in the film, to me, were the ones suggesting that Russia would never have invaded had Ukraine kept nuclear weapons that were on its territory after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Um, that misguided faith in nuclear deterrence, which was echoed here, 
has been one of the biggest obstacles to nuclear disarmament, as far as I can see. What lessons do you think we should be taking from the Ukraine war when it comes to making the case for the elimination of nuclear weapons? The most obvious one is they still exist. Um, how do they, how do we change the underlying dynamic of that situation? And given your life's work, you know full well, I mean, one of the things I feel that the film does present again, and all three films have in one way or the other told the story of the Ibaka Shah mm -hmm. and those that actually have experienced and survived the bombings in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But as you also know, it's not just the bombings themselves, 2000 tests that took place over a thousand of them in the United States alone. I was just reading an article a couple of days ago about those of a certain age, which we are, have in their bones, literally, the, the results of the bombings from that period of time, particularly in the late 40s and 50s into the 60s. How do we change that underlying presence, if you will, of the continuing use or possible use of nuclear weapons? I think that's really the underlying question, given the fact that we all know, and those in the nuclear weapon states, as well as those in the non-nuclear weapon states, if you sit down and have a conversation with anyone and explain the results of the testing and the use in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, I think everyone can get it. So as is reflected in the film, Who's going to make the first move to move away from those weapons that still exist? I mean, certainly the TPNW was an initiative to change that underlying dynamic of the kind of stasis that we seem to be in when it comes to the nuclear weapon states. Yep. I, I think that's really one of the great challenges that we face. Who is going to make a move? I mean, God forbid there is any further use of nuclear weapons as has been threatened by Mr. Putin. Um, and there are a lot of interpretations as to why he's made the threat. Some of them are presented in this film. Mm -hmm. But you know, what is it that's going to wake people up to the fact that they're not needed? I mean, I think that's really the challenge and the whole idea about deterrence, um, which you brought up. Um, you know, and continue to talk about. And certainly the organization that you represent has been a major leader in that idea of moving away from the dangers of nuclear weapons and what they can cause if they're ever used again. Mm -hmm. you, you said about this film, and I'm, I'm quoting here from the, the sort of uh, introductory material you wrote for the website, that it looks to the future, profiling individuals and organizations working to answer the question, regardless of which side of the story they are on. Um, what guided you, Bob, in your decisions about whose voices to present in this film? And do some voices matter more than others? Um, John, I'll let you answer that question, and I'll tell you what I tried to do. What, what did you respond to? Well, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not sure what you mean. In terms of the people that are in the film, what did you respond to in terms of the folks that are speaking in the film? Um, well, that, that's an interesting question because I had different responses to different people. Um, I, I know a lot of them. I recognized a lot of them. Um, some of them I know of without necessarily knowing them personally, uh, but there were different kinds of people in this film. So, and some of them seemed to me like um, the sort of older crowd that's been doing the same stuff over and over again for years and not getting anywhere and trying to scratch their heads and figure out why. And then there was a whole big group of young people who know that they're gonna be inheriting these things and are determined to do something about it. 
and I actually had a better response to them. And maybe that's just my own you know, sort of jaded sense of things anymore. Um, but it, it was the young people, I think, who, who really sort of grabbed my attention the most. You've answered the question and stated the purpose of the film. Yeah. I mean, those that have been around for a long time, I think share the wisdom, if you will, and the experiences of what has happened over the past 78 years because of the fight, if you will, of their challenges. And even those voices that are in the film that represent the nuclear weapon states. M many are not um, telling the story in any other way that they know. Mm -hmm. But I think the young, and one of the reasons the purposes of this film is to present the voices of the young, because after all, as we both appreciate, they're the ones that are going to inherit this. And I think that by making this film, particularly this film, I wanted to leave them with the legacy of what has occurred over the past 78 years, because they're gonna to have to deal with the future. Mm -hmm. And those that are in the film obviously are interested in this subject and they're learning as the voices I'm intrigued by, and some you may, see are younger and some are a bit older, that's going to unfold over the course of the next, whatever, 20, 30 or 40 years. And hopefully they won't have to cope with a lot of the threats that exist now, but I wouldn't put any odds on the table when it comes to that. But at the same time, I think there's knowledge that they can acquire and information that they can develop. And the ideas, the Einstein quote that I use in the film, maybe take it to another level of consciousness mm -hmm. than, than we have been able to do. And mm -hmm. the collective we, as opposed to individual we's. But I think that's really the purpose of this documentary is to put together the information in a way that is comprehensible, no matter whose voice you hear, because there are several voices in the documentary the purpose of filming at both the TPNW as well as the humanitarian conference in um, in Vienna was to show initiatives mm -hmm. that are taking place. Certainly TPNW is a relatively new initiative and the NPT continues to go through its cycle. But my opinion about that is, I think we're better with the NPT than we're without it. I mean, I know there are arguments on many ways, that it's a spent force, maybe, but at least there's a challenge of trying to find consensus, which as reflected in this documentary was not achieved um, in this last round in August of 2022. But it also reflects, I think the NPT reflects what the dynamic is at this time, which is still ongoing, which is the the war in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. So, but it's really that kind of dichotomy that's taking place in, among the many voices that I felt was important to present. Mm -hmm. um, one set of voices that you've, already, you've alluded to a bit um, that's, that are in the film are um, some of the victims of nuclear weapons, the, the survivors of the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And, and I think you were probably alluding to the, the victims of, of testing whose uh, populations and lands were contaminated with radiation and other poisons. Um, anyway, those voices are prominent in this film. And uh, their stories and their testimony made a big impact during the international conferences and negotiations that produced the Ban Treaty. Um, as we know, the remaining Hibakusha are nearing the end of their lives. Um, what do you think is the significance of the loss of those firsthand accounts? to future nuclear disarmament issue efforts. And um, how do we make up for that loss when they're gone? I feel that the voices have to be heard. I mean, films can present their voices, but it's not the same effect as hearing a living voice. Uh, there's no question about that. But also they work at being represented by their, you know, the younger, um, 
the younger, uh, who are not really Habakkashaw, but their voices are taken over by all those that still represent what that experience was in Japan. Um, and I think, but it's, but it's not the same. I understand that. Mm -hmm. But I, one of the things I wanted to do with this film was to repeat the footage that was filmed immediately after the bombings in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And also the woman from the Red Cross who essentially narrated that part of the film, including the note from the International Red Cross representative who was the, one of the first Westerners in Hiroshima and, and wrote back telling the story of what had happened. So I think there are many ways to at least keep that idea alive mm -hmm. and realize the underlying realities, no matter how you look at this story, it's not good. I mean, God forbid anyone does set off a nuclear bomb or a series of bombs, it's going to cause irreparable damage. And there are so many voices that I could have included. You could you could go on for hours in terms of the number of people that are working on this topic in one way or another. And certainly your organization is doing that. You know, and I think it's important that, you know, these voices are heard mm -hmm. through the representatives of the organizations themselves. Mm -hmm. A slight pitch on the website, thenuclearworld.org, I've created something called the, the Connection Portal. And on that, there are a series of organizations that are out there working, if you will, in the vineyards. And I'm going to be adding more because these are the folks that are the active participants in creating an environment for knowledge and memory. And I think it's very dependent also on historians and schools and other places to present and make sure the memory doesn't go away. But there's no question, looping back to the original question you asked, the voices of the Abakasha in living form still labor to make sure that folks understand the underlying realities of the bombs. Because after all, the bombs themselves didn't cause the damage. It was the people that made the decision to drop them. And that's what has to be changed. And voices like Sergio Duarte, uh, you know, as you know, several people that are, are or were leadership positions, they continue to repeat why it's important to understand this dynamic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Circling back to the Ukraine conflict, um, a lot of people who approach the subject of nuclear weapons, and some of them are featured in your film, um, not one group of them, um, seem to talk about the danger in terms of a single nuclear detonation. Um, and maybe that's because the loss of a single city and its population, um, while it's horrifying, is, is maybe still something we can wrap our heads around, um, if just barely. Um, I've heard people say that that in itself is reason enough to get rid of, of these weapons. Um, and that may be so. But the reality is that the operational policies of the nuclear armed states make it extremely unlikely that the use of nuclear weapons would end with a single detonation. In the case of Ukraine, uh, there's a very strong possibility that we'd see very rapid escalation, and we're talking a matter of hours, uh, to a nuclear war that would devastate Europe put the U.S. and Russia on a nuclear collision course with each other, and in the worst case, produce a nuclear winter that would end human civilization, if not humanity itself. This would happen not because anyone wants it to happen, but because the system is wired that way. The average person doesn't really get this, I don't think, um, and it's not hard to understand why. But from what you've encountered, why do you think so many people who have nuclear weapons on their day-to-day -day agenda whether they're in government, the military, the diplomatic corps, or, or various policy think tanks, try so hard to deflect attention from the real consequences of the use of nuclear weapons. I think you've answered your own question because it's hard to comprehend. And I think our role but is if you to- in, If you sit in meetings with them you know, and, and talk with them about it, which I've done for years, they say, we know that stuff. 
we get trained in that stuff. We take, you know, seminars in that stuff before we ever start our jobs. We get it explained to us. We understand it. We know it. Um, so, you know, you don't have to tell us about it. And yet, you know, if they have that knowledge, it doesn't seem to really influence what they're what they're doing. I have a very short answer to that. I, when I was in the U.S. Army in Germany, I spent a year working on nuclear weapon planning as an enlisted man. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to talk about what I learned mm -hmm. because I made a commitment never to do that. Mm -hmm. But one day I remember standing at the door of the safe room talking with a, a sergeant. And I said, I'm curious, why do you do this work? What is it about this? And his answer was, because it's my job. Now, if you look at that, how do you how do you crack that nut, if you will? Mm -hmm. It's my job. Mm -hmm. And also in the first film, I had a series of photographs by Paul Shambrum, where he showed he had permission given to him by the US military to shoot um, images, still photography. And those people that were working in nuclear weapon facilities, be it planes or submarines or whatever, they were doing their job. Does that make them bad people? I mean, you know, I think it's a matter of where you are in that context. I think it's hard to really comprehend how people could do that work without understanding the consequences. But they do it. And I think you know that answer as well as I do. Mm. How do you get people that are involved? I remember one time I was filming at uh, the um, museum at Los Alamos. And there was a, a public uh, book where people could write their comments about what they were experiencing, looking at all of the displays. And I noticed a, a young officer who worked and he had the label of a one of the uh, silo commanders, if you will, clearly identified on his uniform. And he was reading all of those comments. And I couldn't help but think to myself, what is his reaction to reading a lot of the comments? But I think it's a, it, it, look, we could go on for hours about this. What is it that creates an environment where someone accepts them as being a reality, ever present reality. I go back to that one statement because it's my job. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's, it's not meant to be a pat answer, but it's meant to be observational. Yeah. How these things deal with it. Mm -hmm. And I know also, I must say that your organization and you personally dealt with this conundrum every day you were working. Mm -hmm. And I dare say you still don't have an answer to what they, in fact, why they accept this as a condition well, sure. of the continuing, I'm not continu right. Right, continuing presence of the weapons. Yeah. But I think that's where the conferences and the treaties and whatever way that can be developed to defray the use of them is most important. And I think also at this present time, we're in a pretty dicey situation. The continuing threats that come out of Russia, mm -hmm. but it's not only Russia. You can, you can create scenarios, which I'm sure you do a lot of as well, of the dynamics between all of the nuclear weapon states. Right. And the fact that China now, I was just reading the other day, probably estimated about 400 weapons that they now have and the number of silos that they're building um, to they're not being housed. They're not being built to house um, weapons. They're being built for use, not for housing. And final thought on that point is that in my second film, I have someone that said, um, why are all these weapons being built without a purpose? Mm -hmm. 
I have um, one last question for you. I want to say one more thing. Yeah, say, go ahead. I'm a, I'm a documentary producer. Yeah. I trained as a, as a news producer back in the old days when it, you know, the idea of just telling the story was ever present. Mm -hmm. um, that's really what I was trained to do. And that's what I've tried to do with these, these films is to provide the information. Yep. Um, well, you're sort of anticipating the last thing I want to talk about then. <laughs> I, I was very interested in the word resolution in the title yes. of the film. Um, in fact, the whole title, In Search of Re Resolution, is, is rather intriguing. Uh, the word, that word has two meanings. Uh, the act of being determined or resolute and the outcome of something that needed to be resolved. Uh, and both meanings, it seems to me, apply here. And I, ex I expect that was deliberate. Uh, can you say something in closing about your own search for resolution in both senses? And what will it take for us to acquire that resolution to act while we still have time? And do you see a clear path forward to resolution in the form of the elimination? Yeah, in the form of the elimination of nuclear weapons. You know, John, it's very interesting. I have tacked on this board that's in front of me, looking up on the wall, just the word resolution. And taking, I'm, I, I'd have to stand up in order to get and read it to you. But when I came up with this word, I developed developed this project as a result. The first film was in my lifetime, mm -hmm. which fortunately it still is. But I was born at a time where, and I, and I was born at a time where um, it was the beginning of the nuclear age. Um, the Requiem was meant to sort of midstream, if you will. And the third piece, which I've now fortunately been able to finish, in search of resolution continues to be a search. And I feel that for my own personal reason, I wanted to be able to provide information that the younger generations could work with. How they take that, those that are involved, is their choice, not mine. But at least the choices I tried to put in the film provide information of consequences as well as underlying realities of what's going on now um, without drawing a conclusion, but more the idea of reflecting what you said in terms of resolution. But I think as, if we, as a human, as a race, I'm talking about everyone in the world, don't come to grips with this, that's where we face the challenges. So I think it's something you can't go hide your head bury your head in the sand there has to be an acceptance of that and that's why i wanted to also include the young in this film those that are committed to the ideas of at least exploring and understanding why do they continue to exist and as you appreciate um those that started the whole ball rolling including einstein um and I, we haven't mentioned oppenheimer certainly at this time the Oppenheimer name is readily available because of that film. Mm -hmm. But I think he had his own challenges. And I think that everyone who was involved in the creation of the bombs and of the, the whole idea of nuclear, they questioned, I mean, people like Leo Szilard and others, um, they questioned, why are we doing this? Well, at the beginning it was because the word was that Germany was heading down the path of getting there before before we did, the United States and um, the United Kingdom at the time, France, what's happened with China. And, and I think the challenge is we should continue to search for a resolution, not trying to project anything about how that can happen. And I think the TPNW in a way is the latest example of people finding a way to struggle to change the dynamic. But it's going to take dialogue by many people 
on all sides of this issue to change it. So what you do in your work and what I do in my work is just a small piece of coming to grips with this. But I think it takes much more than that. And I guess what I hope for is that there will be a gathering of common understanding for the future. And people say, well, that's very Pollyannish. It doesn't mean it can't happen. But I think to be silent is a challenge. Not to be withstood, if you will. I think it just takes voices and dialogues. We don't know what that solution is going to be, but I think it's important to continue searching for it. Well, I think that's a good note to, to pause on. I was going to say to, to end on, but we're not going to end. We're going to pause, right? Okay. And take your, your message to heart. Bob Fry, thank you very much for, for producing this new film and for the two that came before it. Thanks for taking the time to, to talk with us about it. And uh, I hope that a lot of people see it and, and take the message to heart and, and actually do something about it as a result of your work. So thanks very much.